RNAi as a tool in crop management. Hello, this is Don Lee. I'm a professor in agronomy and horticulture at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And I've listed here on this slide the five areas I'll I'll tackle in this presentation as uh, I try to get you familiar with RNAi, what it is, how it works, and how it could be something that's an important part of, of crop management decision making. But before I jump into these five items, I want to uh, give myself uh, this little prompt to not just focus on the molecular genetics, the transgene part of this technology, but also to, to think about the fact that, that the geneticists who make this, these discoveries and do this work work with plant breeders, work with agronomists who are evaluating uh, potential seed products out in the field, okay? So while I'll focus on discovering and designing genes and then the technologies that are being used to take those those genes and introduce them into living plant cells and genetically transform those cells. I want to emphasize that this has to go along with the work that breeders do and has to then be coupled with good field evaluation so that uh, the designed characteristics that uh, the genetic modification is, is uh, intended to do results in what we want to see out in the field, in the farmer's field, whether it be insect resistance or disease resistance. We'll talk about how RNAi could be used as a potential new kind of pesticide treatment and how it's being used now in products to control end use value. You don't get to the final product until you complete the entirety of this process from science discovery to technology evaluation. So I wanted to emphasize that. Okay, so let's just jump in. Uh, and I wanna emphasize first that RNAi is transgenic technology. So I've got a little step-by-step -step, uh, roadmap that all genetic engineers, all the scientists who create transgenic plants will follow. So let's just uh, use uh, the transfer of a trait from a bacteria, Pseudomonas, to soybeans as our example, okay? So genetic engineering is powerful because you can do uh, cross-species gene transfer. So Pseudomonas uh, bacteria uh, has the ability to provide for the plant resistance to a herbicide called dicamba. The way that works is the geneticists have to isolate all of the genes, all the DNA from the Pseudomonas bacteria and then they have to know the one specific gene that they can isolate and make copies of that encodes a protein, in this case, a protein that detoxifies the dicamba herbicide molecule. So that's a, a gene that's naturally found in, in uh, bacteria, but you want this gene to be present inside a plant cell and then expressed inside of a, of a plant cell. So you have to modify the gene so it's ready for plant expression. And then you have to do introduction of that, of that transgene, that modified transgene into living soybean cells that are growing on a Petri dish. Using uh, tissue culture techniques, you can propagate then entire soybean plants from those uh, uh, tissue culture plates. And if they're functioning as normal plants or flowering and reproducing, you can hand them off to the plant breeder and they can do crossing between these transgenic plants, these plants that have a new transgene and any other variety of soybeans. So, so that uh, plants with different uh, maturities or disease resistance of other kinds uh, can also have this uh, transgenic trait, in this case, dicamba resistance. So these are the steps in making a transgenic uh, plant. Uh, these are the steps that you would uh, use to make uh, transgenic Bt corn plants. You start with a different organism, in this case, Bacillus thuringiensis. You're working with a different gene that encodes a, a different protein. You're gonna introduce the modified gene into corn cells rather than soybean cells, since it's a, a, a corn uh, modification process, but once you have that propagated plant that contains and expresses the transgene, you can hand it off to the plant breeders and they can finish the technology transfer and tr and cross this, uh, this new uh, gene, this new trait into hybrids farmers would want to grow. So let's talk about uh, RNAi then as a 
genetic engineering or a transgenic technology. And, and I'm going to start with the first RNAi that was commercialized. So this is a, a publication in Science uh, Magazine that I read in 1986 when I was a grad student. I was working on my PhD, and, and I got to be honest, I did not understand how this uh, was working. This team of scientists had decided they wanted to try to trigger virus resistance in plants by introducing into the plant using genetic engineering a gene that encode, encoded a code protein uh, from the virus, okay? Their hypothesis was that doing that would trigger an innate immune response in the plant. They didn't really understand how that worked, but they they wanted to try it. So they, they uh, isolated a gene uh, from a mosaic virus that encoded the code protein. Uh, they modified it so it would be expressed in the plant cells, introduced it into a number of different plants. And, and one of the crop species they introduced it into was the squash. Uh, they could hand those transgenic plants off to the breeder and it worked. They were able to get uh, disease, virus disease resistant uh, uh, traits uh, induced by this uh, a transgenic approach, uh, and it could be passed on to other plants. It didn't, however, work the way they thought they did. Instead of the plants making uh, the virus coke protein that induced an immune response, it was triggering a process that we now know is RNA interference. They didn't know it at the time. They knew it worked. It was commercialized, uh, but they didn't know the details of how it worked. Now we understand these details and we can take advantage of them to use RNAi as a technology. Okay, so RNAi is transgenic technology. You're introducing new genes, uh, but you're, the impact of those genes is different. And to understand that difference, we need to have a good understanding of the, of the role that RNA molecules play in the biology of controlling traits. So let's uh, tackle that. So as you can tell, I'm going to give you a presentation here, a learning event that's uh, focused uh, at the level of biology that's more at the cell and molecular level. So many of you are more accustomed to thinking about uh, plants at the field or at the organism level. We need to be concentrating our thinking on what's happening in the plant at the cell level. Okay, so, so the cell has compartments, the nucleus on the left, the cytoplasm on the right, we see the chloroplast there. All of the genetic information that's being modified resides in chromosomes that are found in the nucleus. Okay, chromosomes are huge. They're big, double-stranded DNA molecules. They're, they're very stable because there's proteins that stabilize them. They have a huge amount of information. One small stretch of a chromosome would be the DNA sequence information uh, that we call a gene. This would be the information needed to provide the cell with the information to build a single protein, okay? So a chromosome might have three, 4,000 genes uh, that are a part of it. So these genes have to be regulated. They have a promoter sequence that's a part of the gene that's an on-off switch. It, this will signal the cell that this is a gene that needs to be turned on in this cell at this time, at this level. Uh, genes have to be regulated, okay? Now, the gene information is in the nucleus, but the actual process of building the protein happens in the cytoplasm. Ribosomes are the protein uh, assembly machinery. You have to have the raw material to build proteins, amino acids. So how does that work? You got your information to build a gene in the nucleus. You have to build the actual protein in the cytoplasm. We got to have an ability to transfer that information. So there is a special enzyme that will recognize a gene promoter when it's turned on, and it'll read that gene sequence information and make a single stranded uh, information molecule called an RNA message, all right? That RNA is much smaller and therefore it's mobile. So once the uh, enzyme that reads the gene and transcribes the information into the RNA is done, the RNA molecule can move. It can leave the nucleus, go to the cytoplasm where the ribosomes will, will uh, be able to find it and read it. So if you have a gene that 
that encodes a protein that you need to make a lot of copies on of in a particular cell. You need to make a lot of that protein. It could be turned on at a high level. So you have lots of copies of those messages. The ribosomes can read those messages and then translate it into an amino acid sequence that has a very specific order. That order determines how the protein folds up, what its structure is, and therefore what its function will be. So if this is a gene that's encoding a protein involved in photosynthesis or maybe uh, amino acid synthesis, that ribosome is gonna build the specific protein that does that. It'll, if it's involved in photosynthesis, amino acid synthesis, maybe oil synthesis, those enzymes, those proteins have to go to work inside the chloroplast. So it'll transfer itself there and then go to work in, in doing its specific uh, job inside uh, of the cell. So RNA plays that key role in transferring the information to tell the cell how to build the protein, what specific sequence does that protein have, how many copies of the protein should there be, and then that will dictate what the protein does to control the, the characteristics, the, the traits, the function of the cell. So RNAs are, play a key role. So how does that come into play then with our transgenic uh, virus resistant squash plant? Okay, so uh, let's just zoom in on on one part of the process where the genetic engineers took the gene they designed, uh, the transgene that had the virus coat protein coding information and a promoter that was a general on off switch. This, was, this promoter would be turned on in all living plant cells. So uh, with lots of copies of that transgene introduced into a living cell, there's a good chance one of those copies could insert randomly somewhere into a in this case, a squash chromosome, and now become a permanent part of the DNA in that chromosome. Now, when the genetic engineers designed this, their intention was to have the gene expressed at a constant rate in all cells, and they predicted it would make this virus coat protein that would provide some sort of protection. Turns out that's not how it worked. Okay, instead, what happened I'm going to show the RNA message here as a single strand of sequence uh, information. For some reason, the sequence in that virus coat protein had a sequence that allowed the RNA to, to fold back on itself, form a hairpin loop and create some double-stranded sequence. That double-stranded sequence is a molecular signal that plants and, and animal cells as well, bacteria cells as well, will recognize this as a signal that a virus has invaded the cell and that will trigger what we call the RNAi response. And that RNAi response prevents the RNA from being used by the cell to build the protein. That formation of the double-stranded DNA from the hairpin looping of the RNA triggered that RNA response. So let's go back into the cell. This would be the squash cell that's got the the uh, coat protein transgene, it's being transcribed to, to make the RNAs, but those RNAs looped over. They had that double-stranded sequence. And so when they were being made, they were actually providing uh, the ability to protect the squash plant from invading virus. So if a uh, mosaic virus invades the, the cell, what the virus is designed to do is take over the cell machinery and get the cell to make lots of copies of virus genes. These would encode virus proteins and the viral proteins then could be used to replicate and package up the virus so it could spread throughout the plant and eventually spread to other plants. That's what viruses do. But if the transgenic plant was making that double-stranded RNA with a hairpin loop, it would go out into the cytoplasm. That would be recognized by uh, naturally occurring proteins made in the cell, proteins with names like Dicer and Argonaut, they would then interact with the double-stranded RNA and induce the, the uh, RNAi response. And what that would do is it would destroy the RNA molecules, not just the, the RNA molecule made encoded by the transgene, but all of the RNA molecules that were uh, it, that were 
directed to be made by the invading virus. This RNA interference shut down the biology program that the virus was directing and therefore prevented the virus from replicating inside the, the plant. So that's how it works. The, the introduction of those transgenes that encode that double-stranded RNA can trigger in a very specific way the shutdown of genes that have that sequence. Okay, let me go back to this slide here. Uh, the RNAi uh, double-stranded DNA sequence is very similar to the to the uh, virus sequences, and so the RNAi process eliminates both of them. That was the discovered power of RNA interference. So if you could introduce a gene into the plant and design it so it would form that double-stranded DNA you would shut down all of the messages that have that particular sequence, okay? So let's take our understanding now of RNAi and compare it to standard transgenics, okay? I, th I think there's some key differences here. So let's uh, think about standard transgenics. In this case, if this was a, a BT corn cell or a BT cotton cell, we would be introducing a new transgene, the BT transgene, uh, that would be designed to be expressed in that cell, okay? So the RNA molecules uh, would, would uh, leave the nucleus, go to the cytoplasm, be read by the ribosomes, make the BT protein, and that would equip uh, the, the plant cells and the tissues to have a toxic dose of these BT proteins to ward off an invading insect, okay? That's how standard transgenics work. The transgene encodes a protein. The protein actually works to control the trait. In contrast, RNAi knocks out the synthesis of specific proteins. So the RNAi message is made. You have to introduce that transgene to encode the message. But once the RNAi is made and leaves the nucleus, it shuts down uh, in a very specific way protein expression. So you don't get a new protein made. So sometimes RNAi technology is also referred to as knockout uh, technology. All right. So uh, a key difference then between, between uh, standard transgenics and RNAi. So Okay, we're maybe about halfway through the presentation here. Let's, I think you're ready for a quiz. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask this question here and give you some uh, choices. And I'm going to ask you to stop the, the, my presentation and, and decide on what the right choice is. Give your brain a chance to answer a question. So compared to standard transgenics, such as BT corn or Roundup Ready soybeans, which statement is true about plants with RNAi technology? Okay, so here are the three choices I'm giving you. Go ahead and stop and and uh, decide what the answer is, and then I'll, I'll uh, you'll get some instant feedback. Okay, so hopefully you followed my instructions. You stopped and you're back. So what's the correct statement? Uh, the correct statement is C. Yes, there, there is a new transgene. It does encode a unique RNA, but no new protein is made. That's the, the essential difference between RNAi technology and the transgenic or genetic engineering technology that's been a part of, of crop management for over 20 years, okay? So... Well, equipped with an understanding of RNA, I, how it's similar to, but different from standard transgenics. Let's take a look at, at some of the current stories of RNAi uh, genetic engineering, uh, uh, some of the targets, some of the stories. Now, I'm a, I'm a college professor. I, I don't have access to company secrets. So everything I'm going to share with you is information that I got from a publicly available database called the GM uh, uh, crops database from ISAAA, all right? ISAAA uh, gathers information that's publicly available and organizes it, makes it easy for somebody like myself to find what's been commercialized in the area of, of uh, transgenic modification. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take you through several products that I've discovered here. And the first one uh, is uh, one that was developed that's uh, uh, for insect resistance in corn, in maize, uh, that is 
uses smart stacks as the commercial name, okay? And the database revealed that this particular uh, uh, genetic uh, event, uh, which is actually an assembly of 10 different transgenes stacked by the corn breeders, and, and it's all been through regulatory approval in this country and several others, all of these are designed for insect resistance or herbicide resistance, or, uh, and it could be that it's the, the uh, European corn borer resistance, or it could be uh, rootworm resistance. So I'm going to focus on, on four of the transgenes here that are designed just for rootworm resistance. And you're going to see, we can see here that three of the, of the transgenes are, are from Bacillus thuringiensis. They're BT genes. They encode these cry proteins. Uh, that are are toxic uh, when consumed uh, by by uh, uh, the Western corn rootworm. The fourth gene, however, DVSNF7, it also targets the Western corn rootworm. All right, but it uses this RNAi uh, double stranded DNA formation strategy. So let's take a look at how this one was developed. The motivation for developing was to give you a new mode of, of resistance to the Western corn rootworm that was different from the BT protein. And uh, so this is the key article here, uh, published in 2007. So it's pretty old now. And look at the, the number of authors that contributed to this. This is a good indication of the teamwork that's necessary to do the discovery and then implement this technology into something that's been been commercialized. So the first thing that the scientists had to do is discover genes that the rootworm has as it's feeding on and growing at the larval stage uh, as a root pest, okay? What genes does it need to express to encode proteins that allow it to to digest the, the corn roots and to grow and develop and advance through its life cycle. They had to discover which genes uh, did the corn rootworm use at this stage of their life, okay? Uh, the way they discovered that is they, they took a look at what genes were being expressed, and then they developed a system where they could take those genes, get RNA messages made from those genes, and then actually feed those RNAIs to uh, to these uh, corn rootworm larvae at the at a really early stage, okay. So they had to do these uh, feeding trials. They they tested 270 different RNAs that were designed to to form this RNAi double strand, okay. And some of them had no effect, no ability to to uh, slow down the growth and development of the larva, and some of them did. So. Those that did that, they didn't often outright kill the, the uh, larva, but they had a measurable effect at slowing down the growth and development. So they could uh, determine the LC50, the toxicity of these, uh, these uh, double-stranded RNA versions of these genes uh, from their feeding trials. And then these would be the ones that they could design transgenes for and do early stage uh, DNA testing. In order to do that, they had to, uh, make that uh, modified gene so that it had a promoter designed by nature so it could be expressed and make this double-stranded RNA in the right cell at the right time, okay? So uh, you're ready for another question. Which of the promoter designs should the scientists be using for this RNAi transgene? Remember, you're targeting the Western corn rootworm larva as it's feeding on the roots, okay? Again, you can stop and pick out your choice and then start again. All right, the correct answer is expressed in the roots, okay? The gene came from the rootworm, but it needs to be transferred to the corn plant and then expressed in the tissue that the insect is feeding on. So again, the genetic engineering steps uh, uh, are going to are going to be used uh, 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 as we've described. You have to design the transgene. It makes that RNAi. It has to be introduced into into your uh, corn cells and uh, propagate plants. And again, if you've designed it properly and it has 
the biological activity, uh, you have a good chance of it being successful. Uh, they happen to use a, a naturally occurring promoter that's uh, found in uh, corn roots. And then that design transgene had to be inserted into some corn chromosome, creating these events. And when it uh, was inserted and expressed, uh, makes the double-stranded RNA. And then to me, this is the really interesting part of uh, what makes RNAi different, what makes this kind of RNAi different. As the roots are feeding on these transgenic corn plants, the RNAi is, is found in the corn cells, the corn tissues that the insects are feeding on. Those RNAi molecules have to be stable enough so that they go from being inside the guts of the, of the rootworms and somehow get transferred inside the rootworm cells that are a part of the, the gut lining. They had to actually, those double-stranded RNA molecules had to get into, into the insect cells. And once they got there, they could trigger that RNAi response, shut down the expression of genes that encode critical proteins, and therefore slow down the development of the rootworm. That is what the biology uh, had to accomplish uh, if it was going to be a useful technology, okay? Now, this now has a, an interesting term called HIGS, host-induced gene silencing. Uh, the corn host plant has the RNAi version of the pest gene. It expresses it and then delivers that RNAi uh, to the insect pest and silences its genes, host-induced gene silencing or HIGS, okay. Uh, of course, in theory, it's it's interesting to talk about. In practice, you got to take it to the field and measure to see if it does indeed have the desired effect of, of slowing down the progress of the, of the rootworm larva and therefore protecting the roots. And the reason I'm talking about it, of course, is because it is a technology that worked and uh, the transgenic plants that made those RNAIAs uh, were able to have normal uh, development of the roots uh, with the same amount of insect pressure uh, that the non-transgenic plants uh, uh, would suffer from uh, and, and definitely have a loss of, of root development, which can cause tremendous problems uh, for the corn farmer as their crop is growing and developing. So RNAi was, this was a good example of, of the, one of the first uh, uh, success stories with RNAi to be used in this Higgs uh, fashion uh, to protect uh, the plant uh, from a crop pest. Okay, so let's continue with our RNA targets and stories and, and take a look at three other products that I learned about in this uh, uh, I am AAA database, okay? Harv Extra, uh, which is a technology applied to alfalfa, innate uh, soybeans and Vistav Gold, or innate uh, potatoes and Vistav Gold soybeans. All right, so I'm um, uh, go to the page where it's describing the Vistav Gold soybeans. And as we take a look at, at uh, the details they provide us here, uh, we can see that they introduced two different transgene, each designed to form the double-stranded DNA uh, because of that hairpin loop. One is called FATB1 and one is called FAD2. Both of these genes are involved in oil synthesis in this developing seed of a soybean plant. And they call these uh, sense and anti-sense segments. The sense segment would be the RNA sequence that is intended to encode the uh, oil synthesis protein. And then the antisense would be the part that folds back and complements the sense, forming that double-stranded DNA. So if you have both the sense and antisense segments, you get that double-stranded DNA, which will trigger the RNAi response. So when these uh, two transgenes were introduced, uh, they form the double-stranded RNA. And that double-stranded RNA shuts down RNA synthesis and therefore blocks the synthesis of enzymes that the plant uses to make saturated oil, all right? Uh, these are enzymes that work inside the chloroplast or transport oils uh, uh, in and out of the chloroplast. If these proteins aren't made, these enzymes don't work, 
then the oil that gets made is a unsaturated oil, oleic acid, and it's a healthier, more desirable oil for many end uses, such as cooking. So they had to design these these genes so they would be expressed specifically in the in the soybean seed as it's developing, and collectively the two genes together were uh, had the desired effect of uh, allowing the soybean. Uh, plants uh, to have higher levels of oleic acid in the seed, okay? An end-use trait uh, was was uh, engineered by the use of the RNAi technology. Let's take a look at another uh, product that involves end-use quality, the Harv Extra, which is a, a alfalfa uh, product, okay? In this case, they took a gene that naturally is found in alfalfa, uh, that's involved in cell wall synthesis. And lignin is a component that can be found in the cell wall to really make the cell wall more rigid, but un less digestible. So if you can shut down the lignin synthesis enzyme with RNAi, uh, the plant will still produce cell walls. They just won't be as rigid and undigestible. And so if that's the desired trait, uh, you can hand those plants off to to the alfalfa breeders, they can transfer these uh, this desired trait into various uh, alfalfa varieties that uh, uh, farmers would, would be able to get to grow well in their production operations. But the hay that's harvested has higher feed value because there's lower levels of lignin in the, in the harvested uh, forage. Okay, so that was uh, a, a good example of RNAi applied to alfalfa. And then the last one I'll share here is applied to potatoes, okay? Uh, potato breeders don't come out with the uh, new potato varieties as fast as corn breeders or soybean breeders do. But uh, post-harvest quality is very important. So all of the, the genes that they're describing here that have been through regulatory are, are RNAi, uh, forming double-stranded uh, RNA, and they're all involved in suppressing the expression of genes that can influence uh, post-harvest quality, all right? And so by uh, getting these genes expressed, the potatoes that are produced have longer shelf life, have fewer uh, problems that, that would make them less desirable for the consumer. Innate Potatoes is the product that, that uh, they're describing here. So uh, these are good examples of both uh, HIGS, where you're using RNAi uh, in in uh, pest management and uh, end use quality applications of RNAi. So the last thing that I want to talk about is what's coming up. What might be the future of RNAi? And we're going to get used to a couple of additional acronyms. I think in the future I'll talk about HIGS and SIGS here. All right. So to get a little bit of insight into the future of RNAi technology, again, I don't know company secrets, but you can take a look at what public sector researchers are sharing in their publications. And here's what I'm observing, that right now in both uh, the United States and around the world, there is public research dollars being invested in the, the genetic discovery necessary for RNAi. And it's happening at record speeds. Uh, we're getting better and better at sequencing the genome of uh, all sorts of different kinds of plants and discovering the genes that they're using to grow and develop and protect themselves from, from uh, diseases and from insects, okay? And because of that discovery, uh, science uh, advance can, and the application of the technologies that we're talking about can follow. OK, so we're seeing it uh, for disease resistance. Uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Nebraska, Anna Velez, is a part of this review paper where they're talking about the RNAi or the double stranded RNA technology for insect pests. They describe both the potential uh, that's there and some of the major challenges that scientists will have. So the public sector is is a, in, is highly uh, involved in making the discoveries necessary to establish uh, potential applications. And we're seeing that the this group of scientists from Italy were examining uh, genes that could that could uh, be used for uh, fungal disease, okay? Mm -hmm. This kind of discovery makes industry highly motivated. And so I grabbed this uh, 
this title from Forbes magazine, industry is motivated because they see the potential to use RNAi technology and come up with new crop protection technologies that have less of the downside that some of the current uh, chemical-based uh, applications such as fungicides have. So uh, with new discovery happening at a fast rate, with the motivation of industry to come up with solutions that that uh, farmers can use to protect their crop, I think there's a lot that we're going to see in the future. Uh, in addition, there is an other way in which this RNAi technology can can be applied rather than uh, making transgenic plants, and that's this area of RNAi sprays. Okay, so I've got a picture here of a soybean field. Yeah, it's hard to tell that this is a soybean field because even though the farmer applied some uh, herbicide application, including Roundup, the mare's tail plants are surviving. They are genetically resistant uh, to uh, the Roundup herbicides. It's possible to use RNAi as a way to overcome this kind of resistance by specifically targeting the biology of the weed, okay? And this would be uh, called spray-induced gene silencing or SIGs, okay? So how this would work is you'd have to design an RNAi that uh, was stable and could be packaged somehow and, and applied, uh, made in high quantities and in some sort of a of a living or non-living system and then applied uh, like you would apply a herbicide and have the desired biological effect. Okay, so I'm ready, I think you're ready for a third question here. The proper RNAi target uh, would, would be RNA expressed from what? Uh, a gene critical for all plants, a gene critical for just the mare's tail, or would either uh, be a good option? Again, you're gonna you're gonna apply this to the to the weeds that are growing in your crop field, and you want to be able to somehow suppress the growth of the weeds. So obviously, you're gonna have to find an, an RNAi message with the sequence specific enough so that it'll target the mare's tail uh, and shut down a critical protein for mare's tail, but it wouldn't affect your soybeans. That are uh, that the farmer is intending to grow out in the field. You make that discovery, you've got the potential uh, to use this SIGS approach, the spray-induced uh, RNAi technology. All right. So again, you know, gene discovery and gene design, coupled with the advances in being able to introduce these transgenes into a variety of crop plants, has set us up for for. Uh, future RNAi products uh, that, that are going to be evaluated. But I wanted to emphasize one last thing. As long as we're learning about genetic modification and got our brains focused on what's happening at the cell and molecular level, uh, we're going to see that RNAi will definitely be influenced by a new uh, genetic modification technology called gene editing. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so we've been talking about transgenesis, introducing new transgenes, coupling that with plant breeding to come up with uh, genetic uh, combinations in seed products. You've been hearing a lot about genome editing as a, a brand new tool that we now have available to us. So how does genome editing work in the simplest way and how might that affect the use of RNAi? Okay, uh, Gene editing is a naturally occurring process that's been, been discovered in microorganisms. Microorganisms get invaded by viruses and they have genes that encode proteins that allow them to recognize those viruses and modify their genes so that they can't uh, take over plant cells, okay? So one of them is uh, one of these uh, gene editing proteins naturally occurring in bacteria is called CRISPR, all right? I want to give you a very simple depiction of CRISPR. There's a part of the CRISPR protein system that's designed for detection, part of it that's designed to cut uh, a specific sequence at a specific place, and then part of it that's designed for editing. So I'm going to use these to represent the combined uh, capability of the protein What's different about gene editing from genetic engineering is you're not introducing a new gene. This protein, when it gets made in a cell, will specifically seek out 
the sequence of the gene it's designed to edit. Okay, in this case, you could you could design it so that it should target uh, gene Q and even target a specific part of that gene. Once it finds that gene, okay, it will go ahead and make a modification and edit in that gene. And that edit could create a new function in the protein that that gene encodes. It could perhaps enhance the function or it could knock out the function. It could create a version of that gene that has no function. And in fact, that's uh, the way uh, some of these uh, gene edited products have been developed to, to use them the same way you would use RNAi to knock out the expression of a gene that is, nat is naturally expressed, normally found in that crop plant. So one of the first uh, products from this was uh, from a company called Calix. Uh, they produced high oleic oil uh, soybeans by knocking out a couple of genes, the same genes that we described that you knock out with RNAi, they knocked them out with gene editing. Now, the advantage that they believe they, they have with the use of this technology is in that it works, uh, but it doesn't introduce a transgene. So the regulatory agencies in this country, at least, are looking at this technology differently than they're looking at uh, transgenic technology, where you're introducing a new gene. It, it's possible that there'll be less opposition from consumers. It's possible it'll have less intended impact uh, on the environment because you're not introducing a, uh, a new transgene. And so for now, at least, uh, the regulatory agencies are looking at, at the regulation and commercialization of these products differently, okay? So if that's the case and, and this technology works in knocking out specific genes, you can think of a number of applications. So for example, some of you uh, might enjoy peanuts just as much as I do because of the proteins and the oil and the flavor uh, that you get from those uh, peanut seeds. But some of you can't enjoy peanuts because uh, some of the proteins found in those peanuts induce an allergy response in your body. What if you could use gene editing and, and knock out the expression of those allergy-causing proteins uh, but not influence any of the other important characteristics that make peanut an important uh, food for humans, okay? Uh, this would be the kind of uh, potential application we would see. So I think as gene editing moves along, we're going to see RNAi used less for end-use quality traits like the ones we described where knocking out a, a gene is, is the goal. Gene editing will replace the application of RNAi, I believe, in the future. Okay, so this has given us a pretty good uh, look at how RNAi technology uh, was discovered, how, why it works the way it works inside living plant cells, and some of the ways it, it could be applied to give us new tools in crop management in the future. I, I think it's always important to keep in mind that the genetic set the molecular level is just one part of the whole technology uh, chain, plant breeders, and then agronomists evaluating these products in the field play their role uh, to, to help farmers uh, uh, come up with these new crop management tools.